broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Krishna Vidula here. Some of you might be able to see me. I don't, let's see if I'm going to turn. Okay, there you go. Uh, Yanis, you want to put on you put yourself also up there. Uh, yeah, let me still. do that. <laughs> uh, you have a distinguished Hold on a minute. Uh, uh, I share my webcam. Yes, there you go. Do you see me? Yes, we see you. Yeah. It's okay. really early for you. Seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, it is a little earlier than, you, <laughs> than and, your uh, case. Going. Yeah. Uh, so as I say, you know, we have almost uh, 200 people here with us, 170, 180, uh, and pretty soon it'll be more than 200. They are excited to hear from you. And, uh, and I did tell them that you are the one who really got this whole thing started about grand challenges and UN sustainability development goals and how we can all work together to make an impact uh, through the engineering education. Uh, many of the Absolutely. audience are faculty and students from engineering colleges in India because we have just started a, uh, a program where we have, along with Engineering Without Borders in India, uh, IUC mm -hmm. and EWB India, we have started a course for the students guided by faculty to do something, do some projects in these areas. So, uh, so that that's great. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, what you have on your screen is, uh, is the, uh, you know, the, you know the, the the topic is obviously engineering a better world for all, better, for all humanity, and 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 then if we and then go and then have, you know lots and lots of stuff that uh, that uh, Dr. Yanis is is just known for, but I just want to highlight a few things and. Uh, and, and and then move on from there. Uh, he is the dean, current dean of engineering at uh, at the uh, University of Southern California, with Turby School of Engineering, and uh, the Zorab Caprielian Chair in Engineering, position he holds since 2005. Uh, he was selected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2008 and continues to serve as a member of the uh, National Academy of Engineering Council. As dean of engineering, he articulated in 2008 the concept of uh, uh, of um, of, of the uh, engineering plus, which is, uh, let's see, my screen keeps moving up and down. Uh, positioning engineering as an enabling discipline of our times and has been actively engaged in efforts uh, to change the conversation about engineering. Uh, he co-founded in 2009 the Global Grand Challenges Scholar Program. He organized and hosted at USC in fall 2010, the National Academy of Engineering Second Grand Challenges Summit, uh, which spurred in 2013, you know, the Grand Challenges uh, Summits. Uh, between 2011 and 17, he has been serving on various committees with the Engineering Dean's Council and the Global Engineering Dean's Council. And I'm just so delighted to have you with us, uh, Yanis. So we can turn off our screens and we can, uh, you know, and you can just say hello to them while you're on the screen. Yeah. And then turn it up. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah. well, thank you very much, Krishna. I appreciate uh, everyone who is here listening to this. Uh, good morning, early morning, mid afternoon, uh, evening, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, I know this is uh, a worldwide audience, so I'm very happy to be part of this. Um, just want to make a correction that uh, <clears throat> the um, Grand Challenges uh, program, scholars program, was started in partnership with Duke University and All in College as well. So these were three colleagues, um, and we're still actually very much involved in the program. Uh, even though one of our colleagues who is, uh, was uh, Dean at Duke, Tom Katsuleas, is now the president of uh, the University of Connecticut, but he still is very much interested in the program as well. So I just wanted to um, make this clarification. Um, I would start with my... Um, I, I, yeah, I'm making you a presenter. I just click the screen and you'll be yours today. You, yeah. be awesome. you can turn right. yourself off. I, you can turn off your video. So uh, that, uh, stop sharing. There you my, go. Okay, oh, very well. Okay, and then I would like now to uh, start with my presentation. You're all set to go. And, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so the uh, the my presentation will be on how to um, use engineering, which is uh, actually honest, a, honest, there is, there's a control panel. Could you cl you can close uh, that by clicking on the arrow, the red arrow on the top. You can close that. The, on the top, yeah. If you click that, it'll go away. It'll go away. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks. And so, uh, um, engineering, my, my talk will be about the extraordinary power of engineering and technology in today's world that essentially can be used for many, many uh, uh, purposes, uh, both good and bad. And my uh, uh, presentation will be to emphasize how technology and engineering can be used for good. Uh, and engineering a better world for all humanity. Um, and uh, the question is, of course, why we talk about engineering. 
and the engineering is because it's becoming the enabling discipline of our times and has two uh, uh, important characteristics one that it is exponentially growing it's growing very fast and there's a reason for that which i will try to explain in a moment and second because it is convergent by convergent we mean what we call this engineering plus concept the fact that it underlines essentially any discipline that involves professional disciplines as well so let's try to understand uh this this concept here and also i should mention that at some point uh we need to understand that uh there is a i wouldn't say a collision but certainly there is a um, a, a closer and closer inter interface between technology and humanity uh engineering and technology grows very fast human nature does not change exponentially fast i would say that in recent years uh, human nature has gone south uh, a little bit uh, and so understanding how this interface is going to happen how is it going to interact uh, the two uh, uh, concepts are going to interact it's going to be a very important part of the future uh, and this is where you know uh, things like uh, consciousness uh, things that characterize uh, uh, humans are becoming more and more important and uh, um, this, are, but this is a separate subject that I, I may want to talk at a separate uh, uh, presentation. Um, I define engineering technology in a very simple way. So when I try to describe what is engineering technology to, uh, let's say, high school students or to parents or people who are not engineers themselves, I use this very simple definition. It is leveraging phenomena for useful purposes. So this is something uh, everyone actually should benefit from using it uh, because engineering, as I mentioned, is converging and growing very fast. So leveraging phenomena for useful purposes is something that I use in a, in a I like to use as a, as a definition of, uh, of technology and engineering. So the question of course is what is phenomena? Phenomena uh, in historically, Engineering technology was associated with physical phenomena, let's say photoelectric effect or mechanical effects. And then with increasing complexity, we deal with chemical phenomena, like for instance, catalysis, geological phenomena, understanding the planet, let's say groundwater. Then, and more and more recent years, biological phenomena, for example, bioengineering, all this in increasing complexity. If you follow this arrow, then you will realize that at some point engineering actually it is happening even now uh it started already happening it's also the dealing with social and behavioral phenomena so people in the social sciences you say well this is actually a domain of social sciences my position is that technology and engineering is so uh, empowering that not too long into the future social and behavioral phenomena will be analyzed and understood from quantitative perspective uh, or at least there will be a tendency in that direction, and that's actually the place where technology and humanity actually are going to intersect as well. So this is the definition of phenomena. The question is, uh, also by phenomena, it means systems, devices, tools, and combinations of thereof. And then the question is, what is useful purpose? So if you use this definition for technology and engineering, it also underlines the importance of, of uh, utility or usefulness and this is where the ethical components come in because what is useful for someone may not be useful for another and this is where essentially this definition encapsulates the ethics of technology and the ethics that have to be actually become part of what we discuss as engineering technology given the, the, the tremendous power of engineering technology in today's world and so um, I, uh, using this very simple definition allows us to capture the essence of engineering technology today, as well as the fact that it is convergence, and the fact that we deal with increasing complexity. And as part of the useful purposes, I also include the discovery of new phenomena. Many engineers uh, in research universities deal with the discovery of new phenomena, whether it's in physics, chemistry, biology, or other places as well. By the way, this definition is not necessarily only mine, but it's paraphrased from a book by Brian Arthur uh, in 2008, uh, The Nature of Technology. Um, 
Um, Tom Friedman of the New York Times wrote an article, wrote a book um, uh, about a few years ago, talk, talking about the era of constant accelerations, that technology is growing faster and faster. And one way to describe this is through an exponential. So here I have a, a little bit of a, of a qualitative graph. The axis mean absolutely nothing in terms of numbers. To consider this as dimensionless numbers. So uh, I don't tell you how I made dimensionless time or technology, but think of it uh, as a qualitative plot where technology, let's say, if uh, however we define it in, in a certain metric, increases exponentially fast. Typically, it's the other part that actually is important in, in this discussion is that uh, we react to technology changes by simply taking a linear extrapolation, we draw a tangent to this curve. Uh, typically, humans have a tendency to think linearly and you extrapolate linearly, but if, which actually is a very good um, uh, thing to do, provided the technology is not moving, uh, changing fast enough. But if, if the technology is changing as fast as exponentially, then clearly you will see that you're going to create a big gap as if you st stay with this curve compared to this curve here. And then this is what I call a fixed mindset. It's a typical reaction to change. Uh, you can see it in policy and politics, uh, sometimes in academia, uh, slow change. Whereas if you were to stay with this particular curve here, I call it a mindset of change, a mindset of growth. And it is very important for everyone to understand that we are living in this particular area here, in this particular regime, where technology is moving very fast. And in order to be able to always stay with this, this is what I call later on hug the exponential, is we have this particular growth of, uh, mindset of growth. Otherwise, there will always be a gap, and this gap will be much more difficult to, to uh, close as we keep moving in this direction. And then there is this, if we are in this direction, then there is a typical nostalgia to go back. Because if you go back in time, then of course you'll go back to where technology and your reaction were about the same. And actually you see a little bit of this in wishful thinking, uh, also politically as well in, in certain ways. Um, another thing that I needed to um, also emphasize is that when you talk about materials, energy, and knowledge, it is only knowledge that has the property that the more it is consumed, the more it is created. Again, that's not my remark. I forgot where I, I made this uh, note and, and, and use it here, uh, but uh, it is an important part of our technology uh, in today's world uh, and the fact that the, we live in the economy and the, uh, of knowledge or society of knowledge because the more knowledge is consumed, then the more we create, which is kind of a counter to the materials and energy side where the more materials you consume, the less you create, obviously. Now, I mentioned that the technology changes are exponential, and I have a little bit of a, of a uh, uh, equation, if you wish, to show that. Let's assume that the technology speed, the rate by which technology changes with time, let's say uh, the rate of change of A with respect to time, take it in this simple way, uh, is proportional to the technology itself. That's not a bad assumption to make. We say that the technology or, or, or the state A increases because the rate of change, the speed, is proportional to the uh, state that we are right now. If you think about it in this way, and you put a constant lambda here, then if you integrate this equation, then clearly you're going to see an exponential. In fact, you can have faster than exponential growth. Let's call it a singularity. This is something that um, uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is a, uh, a vice president for engineering at Google, uh, has uh, proclaimed for a while that the technology is not only used, it goes exponentially fast, but it's even faster than that, and it will approach some sort of a singularity. Whether this is going to happen or not, uh, it's unclear. However, mathematically, you can show that this is possible if instead of dA dt is proportional to A, you say the ADT is proportional to a to a power n, where n is a number greater than one. Indeed, if you have this type of kinetics, if you want this type of equation, and you can integrate it, then you can show that there's a singularity for that. And so I will use one more slide with equations, just to show you that actually you can <laughs> you can prove these things. And this is my I try to to think of the evolution of technology as a chemical reaction, and I use chemical kinetics for it. So I'm a chemical engineer, so 
uh, whenever I see anything, I, I try to use a chemical, a chemical genetics approach. So let's assume that the technology it grows in this way, that is um, from technology, you create new technology, and that this type of, of reaction, which is a very simplistic one, uh, if those of you who know anything about uh, rate of reactions, you know that this particular reaction is proportional to the concentration or the, or the, or the value of this, namely this type of reaction. And then if you integrate this, this is an exponential, and then you get what is known as Morse law. Now, Morse law is usually associated with transistors. And, um, but what I am trying to say here is that, in fact, it is, it is um, um, uh, technology grows exponentially fast, regardless of whether there's physics associated with this or chemistry. The only thing you need to know is that the kinetics of the, of the technology growth is simply proportional the rate of change is proportional to the uh, quantity itself. Then you will get an exponential, and potentially more slow is one part of that. And I mentioned before that if you were to do uh, uh, quadratic kinetics, let's say it takes the collision of two technologies to create a new one, let's say along this line here, then the rate of change of A with T is proportional to A squared, because this is this times that, if you integrate this, then you can show that the A is proportional, not only exponentially fast, but it goes like one over T star, which is a singularity time minus T. So as T approaches T star, then obviously this goes to infinity, and that's Kurzweil's conjecture, which is the singularity. So if we are to plot this, then it goes like this, which sounds like exponential, but then as it approaches the singularity, it increases exponentially fast. Again, this is a conjecture that, um, uh, Coach file has made, um, and uh, uh, whether we know what this time is or whether it will happen at any particular point in time, it's unclear. But if you look at the, the you know, how fast uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all that is, is growing, you may think that not too far into the future, we may have a situation where technology is really ex extraordinarily powerful. And that is where it becomes important to then use it for, 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 good, for good and for uh, useful purposes. So I hope I have convinced you that the previous slide that I have here about the, the fact that technology is growing very fast is, is not wrong and that it follows this particular, uh, one could essentially show this by a simple kinetics of this type. Now, one we can make the comment that, well, that may be possible, but then you have uh, things that happen. For example, we have the coronavirus uh, situation, crisis, in which, of course, this reaction is going to slow down. Or you have, you know, different global realities and, and uh, you know, politics uh, 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 be, are, are coming in here and interfere with this kinetics. That is true, and it is possible that, you know, this may not continue as uninterrupted. However, under conditions in which everything else is, 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 is aside, these kinetics are likely to be followed. Assuming that we are here then, the question is why convergence? Uh, and convergence is what I call this engineer plus. Because convergence is, um, I, I characterize convergence as something that engineering, I call it engineer plus X. X here can be vectors. Engineering can be a vector. By this I mean, Engineering doesn't mean that uh, could be mechanical or chemical or, or, or uh, electrical or computer science. X can be anything and could be media, medicine, entertainment, biology, education. Um, we see more and more traditional disciplines like medicine hiring engineers in, in, in their professions. This is true in entertainment. Here at the, at the University of Southern California at USC, we have a very strong uh, school of cinematic arts. Um, and we partner with, uh, with uh, cinematic arts in a very significant way in the area of games. Uh, education is another part, media, um, particularly digital media. You see a lot uh, more of uh, computer scientists and, and uh, people that do signal processing and analysis be involved in it. So this convergence is happening before in front of our eyes and it will continue being the dominant uh, part of the future. And I look at three pathways by which convergence can be established. One is what I call E2X, where engineering empowers X. X could be, let's say, media or entertainment. 
There is also a kind of a opposite of this, sort of the biomimetic thing where X empowers engineering. Uh, this could be, for instance, in the case of the neural system. Let's assume that people try to develop computers that behave like uh, the brain uh, or have the, the properties of, of, of the human brain. And in this case, you can use, let's say, biology or uh, anatomy to empower engineering. And that, in a way, this is using nature's optimization that has happened over, over the, the thousands and millions of years of evolution in order to be able to uh, enable engineering. But more important, the most important part of convergence is where both engineering and X commingle together. And this I call uh, engineering union X, in which both of them work together. It's almost like a double helix in which advances in engineering uh, help X and advances in X then and that's, uh, help engineering. And that's actually the most profitable and the most prosperous way by which you do that. Consider now how to use this, um, all these ideas in, in terms of using technology for good. And the, the question is then is why grand challenges of any type. And I believe that we live in, a, in because of the fact that technology is powerful, fast evolving and convergent, allows us to set achievable goals for our humanity. I think we are, for the first time in history, in a situation in which we can have technology be used for good in a very significant way and to solve within uh, the foreseeable future big important problems that can vary along many, many different dimensions. And I think that the ethical question of our times is what goals are we need to choose in order to be able to solve, to use technology for good this powerful tool to be able to, to, to address uh, significant problems, and let's call them grand challenges. Uh, grand challenges are a number of them. Uh, one of them is the set of the National Academy of Engineering grand challenges, which were started in 2008. Now, I want to make sure that um, we don't uh, uh, narrow the grand challenges to the specific 14 grand challenges of engineering. Um, the specific grant types for engineering from the National Academy uh, deal with solar energy, energy from fusion, managing the nitrogen cycle, uh, preventing nuclear terror, and the like. These are actually a good set of challenges. However, one should be uh, able to generalize and look at them in terms of buckets. One bucket is a bucket of sustainability. So I have one, two, three, four, five grant challenges in the bucket of sustainability. There are four challenges in the bucket of security, securing cyberspace, restoring and improving infrastructure. There's a bucket on health, engineering better medicine, advanced health informatics, reverse engineering the brain. And there's a fourth bucket, let's call it enriching life. How do you enhance virtual reality? How to learn better? And also to engineer the tools of scientific discovery. So when we look at the grand challenges of the National Academy, I think we should look at them at these four buckets, sustainability, security, health, and rich in life. And if you go to Maslow's hierarchy, which is Maslow is a psychologist and talks about hierarchy of needs for individuals, we can do the same thing for uh, the planet, if you wish, or society at large. And so sustainability as part of the uh, uh, physiological uh, needs of a human, uh, health in terms of uh, also the same thing, enriching life instead of esteem and self-actualization and many other things as well. So there is a, if you wish, a, uh, a map of the NA grand challenges to uh, what I call Maslow's hierarchy. And there's a way by which therefore uh, one can use and solve important problems, for instance, in, uh, that also include humans, for instance, in the, in the United States, uh, in many cities there are, there is a very, uh, unfortunate uh, situation with homeless uh, people. And the question is, how can you use technology or other ways to, to address this problem? And at some point, this then comes to the behavior and societal impact. Uh, and the question is, what kind of grand challenges will be there that can be used with, uh, can be solved by technology? This is our part of the, what we, we call wicked problems. Uh, very much related to this are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So by grand challenges, I don't necessarily mean all, only uh, the National Academy, but I look at the UN, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Many of them, in fact, um, 
a map into the Grand Challenges of Engineering, clean water, for instance. Um, there are affordable, affordable and clean energy. Many of these uh, come, come up there as well. But there are a number of them that in, involve people, no poverty, uh, gender equality, and, and, and uh, reducing equalities and the like. So I think that these are uh, the places where it's uh, or, or, uh, organizational, societal, societal organizational problems uh, or uh, topics or issues, but this is where I think technology can also be used in a way, and I will talk a little bit about these wicked problems in a moment. Uh, on a different uh, way, the social work has developed their own grand challenges. I have participated in the formulation of these concepts here by partnering with uh, our colleagues uh, here at UAC on social work. And this is very different than the grand challenges of uh, engineering for National Academy. For instance, this is well-being of individuals and families, or strong, stronger social fabric, or just society. So you can see that um, grand challenges exist across the, the board. Uh, ma many, like these ones, are more difficult because it involves humans. The previous ones are perhaps more straightforward. But sooner or later, I think we're going to come in and to uh, use technology tools in order to be able to help solve problems that are fundamentally uh, driven by, by, by human nature. So if we are to think about engineering in this way, then we are essentially changing the conversation of engineering. And the idea is, um, by what I'm trying to, to say, is that what we do as engineers, who we are, and what we look like, because by proposing this framework for engineering and technology, it attracts to the profession people that are not the typical engineers that were attracted in the field, let's say, 30 years ago or, or when I was growing up. Uh, where the idea was that if you are good in math and you know good in physics, uh, then you go to engineering. Now it is not only that; it is I want to solve a significant problem for society, and I can see that engineering technology can help me do that, and therefore this is what I want to do. And that this is the reason why uh, we see more and more, for example, women attracted into engineering. In my own school last semester, last fall. Uh, the entering class was exactly 50-50 uh, between undergraduates, between engineering, between women and men. So it was a balanced uh, uh, gender demographics for the first time in, in, in the school's history. But we have also been growing this per percentage significantly year after year. And one of the reasons is because we present engineering in this type of, of, of uh, uh, transformative way. So as part of this, we have started this Cancer and Scholars Program, uh, which was conceived almost 11 years ago, and now it has been adopted by many schools, not only nationwide, but globally, and has become a signature program of the National Academy. And that is consistent with the World Economic Forum report, Forum report on the skills for the 21st century, as well as with creativity, leadership, perseverance, uh, and it is consistent with the engineer of 2020, although I'll say more about this in a moment. Essentially, we try to cultivate what I call mindsets, and I will differentiate this from, um, from competencies, because mindsets are more uh, 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 things that, that last longer than simply competencies. A competency is something that you can learn. Maybe uh, three years from now or five years from now, there's a new tool in place. That's competency that you have to relearn. However, mindsets are ones that keep you uh, fixed, uh, that, that, that keep you um, uh, equipped with an uh, approach to be creative, uh, multidisciplinary, entrepreneurial, and uh, innovative, uh, understanding cultures, and be uh, conscious of societal needs. And I will rephrase them in a different way in, in, in a little bit later. By the way, this um, picture is from the Grand Challenge Summit of the National Academy uh, the Global uh, Summit in 2017. Uh, Rick Miller is the president of Wallen College, as I mentioned. Tom Katsoules is the, currently the president of Connecticut, University of Connecticut, and Jenna Campbell, uh, Jenna Carpenter is the dean at the uh, Campbell University, and this is part of the uh, uh, panel that we had in that particular challenge, uh, summit. Now let's think about the attributes of the Engineer of 2020. The Engineer of 2020 was a publication of the National Academies that came up in 2006, if I'm not mistaken. 
and basically try to predict what should be the attributes of the engineer in 2020. So as you go through this, you will encounter your usual things, skills, ingenuity, communication, uh, business and management, ethics, professionalism, uh, agility, lifelong learners. So these are all very interesting and important. And however, this they deal mostly about competence. In other words, how competent you are as a, whether you have the competent properties of, let's say, uh, technological properties or communication skills or, you know, business skills. What I think is missing from the engineer of 2020 is purpose, character, and trustworthiness. And this is something that I wanted to start emphasizing more and more, that nowadays, exactly because technology is so powerful and so enabling, uh, the users of the technology and the developers of the technology have to be people that are trustworthy. So society will increasingly demand trustworthiness and purpose from our engineering graduates. I believe that this is around the corner. Higher education has been, um, in a way, um, uh, I won't say attacked, but uh, certainly, you know, people uh, believe that this is an elite organization that therefore the, the graduates of them uh, have no purpose or trustworthiness. And society will increasingly ask us to solve also human-centric problems, which I call wicked problems. And therefore, this attributes, I believe, is already part of our Grand Challenge Scholars Program. I will call it now Grand Challenge Scholars Program 2.0, and they expand the attributes prescribed by the engineer of 2020. So I wanted to, meant to position that this uh, whole concept of these five mindsets of the Grand Challenge Scholars Program is, an, an large, is, is a better version of the engineer of 2020 by also including trustworthiness and purpose. So let's try to understand what is trust. Trust con consists of two components, competence and character. By the way, this is from uh, Stephen Covey. He wrote an excellent book called The Speed of Trust. Um, Capabilities like talent, attitude, skills, knowledge, performance, past, current, and anticipated, these are all competence. However, uh, important things such as integrity, humility, courage, motive, agenda, and behavior are parts of character. And I think that sooner or later, society we will demand from us as engineering schools to produce engineering graduates that not only combine competence, but also the character part. And I think that's something that will come around the corner because as you see in today's news, uh, you know, technology that's in the hands of people that essentially have different motives and agendas or behavior, uh, they are actually, uh, can be quite a bit of a dangerous uh, thing for society as well. So I would think that we need to develop mindsets. And in engineering schools, we are very good at being from providing students knowledge and skills, but I think we should also be providing mindsets. In other words, not only how, what is the specific knowledge of today or the skills of today, but also mindset that helps us help us go from here to there and be able therefore to uh, provide uh, our students the, the ability to be able to think and, 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 and be useful members of, uh, and practicing members of engineering and reinvent themselves every year, uh, given the, the, the rapid changes of technology. So this is, I think, where the Grand Challenge Scholars Program comes in. Um, and so here are five mindsets that I can articulate the Grand Challenge Scholars Program. The first is, you cannot be a, a, a good engineering technologist unless you have superb skills, right? So I call this hug the exponential. Second is engineering plus, change the conversation about engineering, and then innovation in the broader sense to help create new markets, new jobs, but also to redesign ourselves. In other words, to reinvent. This is an important part of, uh, because of the, the rapid changes in technology, this is a very important part of what we do, flexibility and agility to change, and that has, or, has to come up with providing the appropriate mindset. And then the other three parts, uh, two and a half parts, have to do with character. Uh, what I call the cultural mind, understanding cultures, broadly interpreted, understanding the human nature, so to help thrive in today's fast changing world, and what, it, what, what does it mean to be human? And finally, 
what I call heroic engineering, awareness of the impact of engineering to society and the importance of technology ethics. These are things, in, the important things that have to be to start in, in, in uh, infusing into our engineering graduates to some extent, particularly in the area of technology ethics, because in my definition of technology, uh, I use leverage phenomena for useful purposes. Useful purposes actually are going to be very significant part of this as well. So the innovation also will change uh, as well. In, in the past, uh, the innovation was at the intersection of three components, technology, business, and design. So this is desirability, feasibility, and viability. It's a well-known intersection. Uh, so you bring in ideas. These ideas have to be accepted and satisfy a need of the, of the market, and then you have to have a business model for this to happen. However, I think in the future, now, in addition to this, innovation has to also in, include uh, some sort of ethical projections as well as legal projections as well. So innovation cannot be um, done in, in, in vacuum of ethics as well as the fact that they are interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary as well. So I think the whole concept is changing and, and how we create new innovation has to also incorporate this part as well perhaps even at the, uh, at the early stages of how uh, you create a new, uh, a new, you put together a new idea or something forward. Uh, finally, I will close by talking a little bit about wicked problems. So at USC, we have created a class last year uh, called, uh, this is a civil engineering class, engineering innovation with focus on human crisis. So the question is, how do you use engineering to solve problems that involve human crisis? In this particular case, the particular human crisis was two refugee camps in the Greek island of Lesbos, which is over here. Um, this uh, is the first stop of refugees that come from Turkey or the Middle East, and they arrive at this island because it's uh, the closest part of the Turkish coast. Then, because the European Union requires all refugees to be uh, processed at the first, first port, port of entry, uh, this uh, um, uh, refugee camps are teeming with people, very unsanitary, horrible conditions for people. So our class uh, involved actually trying to understand can we, can we create innovations in order to be able engineer innovation to make this, the life of these of this people much better uh, uh, while we are processed there. So this is trying to, uh, and there were pet, five designs that were studied, um, and I can give you more details about that. It included uh, uh, discovery. Uh, of the issues by sending people in the uh, our students in the island and trying to understand the conditions by which people live. The motto of the class was lives, not grades, and it was emphasized, define, ideate, prototype, and test. So again, is is where you have social uh, entrepreneurship, if you wish. How do you get into a situation in which you use technology and engineering? Uh, these very powerful tools in order to solve a significant problem that in includes a human crisis. And this class continues this year as well, and we'll start, uh, we'll be moving, dealing with different types of crisis as well. Finally, why ethics? Because useful purposes are goals, and uh, technology has unintended consequences, which are increasingly powerful, and therefore making a decision to go with the right part of technology is the right way to do. When you make decisions, um, decision making consists of uh, the intersection of three circles. One is smart. Clearly, you want to make decisions that are smart. Um, second has to be legal. Clearly, you have to have legal dec decisions that are legal. But there's an, in third point, which actually is uh, the decision to be ethical. Ethical and legal do not necessarily coincide. You can make a legal decision, but um, it may not be the right decision, the right thing to do. So many times, many organizations elect to do work at the smart and legal part. I think in many ways, you have to also start thinking about what are the ethical components of your decision and how do you make decision making at that intersection? So this is actually how technology is developed and to be used. It has to be smart for sure, it has to be legal, but also it has to be a technology that stays on the ethical side. And I think that's something that we see repeatedly today in the world, uh, social media, other places, on how ethics interfere with the technology as it's developing. Because as, as I mentioned before, 
technology being exponentially fast, we usually think along the tangent, and sometimes technology is faster than our decision making in terms of ethics and, and, and legal components. So these are important questions that have to come in and will have to be uh, for our engineering students need to understand all these decisions, all these issues as well uh, on how values therefore become important part of technology development. So I'll close by some using some mnemonic rules, highly exponential, plus innovation in the broadest sense, the cultural mind and heroic engineering, and that we are changing a new paradigm. We hopefully that the, the engineering education uh, is to be used to address and solve humanities goals, creating trustworthy engineer, and changing the conversation about engineering and engineering education. So that's all I had to say. So thank you wow. very much for listening, and I'll be happy to uh, take questions. Sure. Thank you so much, Yanis. This has been fantastic. I mean, you have uh, addressed a very complicated subject and inspired all of us, and you even used equations just like a good engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I could not, I could not have not use equations. <laughs> people have started uh, talking about the wicked problem, they say, well, why is it wicked? And as you know, so I guess that's a that's a good point as to why it is wicked. So you can. Yeah, yeah. So, so what we will do is, I, I have uh, identified a few individuals who may have some comments. Uh, these are people from IFES and uh, absolutely, mm -hmm. and, and some people from the uh, from IUC and Engineer Without Borders in India. So, I, I'll give them a chance if they want to say uh, make a comment. It's fine. Otherwise, they can just pass, and I'll move on. And we have uh, several people in the. Uh, uh, in the in the uh, in, in the okay, I can I can put my camera on too, so you don't feel alone. <laughs> so, okay, so so we will we will we will do this and uh, and so let's let's see uh, let's we have uh, uh, I'm just going to go down this list. I'm going to start with Ramiro, who's the president of IFES. Ramiro, jump in. Good morning. Thank you, Yanis. As always, your conversations are thought provoking. Thank you, Krish, for organizing. This is very aligned. <laughs> with the outcome of, uh, of the Reef 2018 GDC, where we started the Peace Engineering. And out of that, we yes. created a Peace Engineering Consortium. We have engaged the national labs. They're very committed. So there's a thrust in the labs on to push Peace Engineering. And we are very taking nice. a, a, a further step we, with several of our partners. We're beginning, we're developing a, Peace engineering data architecture, so we can measure transactions at the very high level, macro, and at the very real time, uh, uh, fine grain. So you touched a lot of topics, and this is exactly what we're addressing. In, but uh, the next step for us is to measure and bring that to everybody, so we can really uh, contribute to society. Thank you, thank you, Ramiro. Yeah, this is wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I can share my presentation, uh, Krishna, anytime yes. I can send it to you and you can send it with and, a and, and yeah, no recorded, by the way, and we have almost 300 people, okay. 300 people in the audience. <laughs> Uh, half of them okay. are students, I think. Uh, I'm going to go to the yeah. uh, the group that's very active in India, the Engineering Without Borders group that are doing a lot, some of these types, uh, types of things. I'm going to go with their leaders, uh, leadership team, Ashok Agarwal and Rajiv Lal. Maybe they have some comments if they're still here. Let me see. Rajiv Lal is here. Maybe Ashok has not. Uh, I think maybe Ashok seems to have gone. Rajiv, would you like to uh, make a couple of comments, Rajiv or Sanjay? Come in, Rajiv. Would you like a comment? It's up to you. And maybe Sanjay would be interested. Go ahead, Sanjay. I, uh, yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, actually, I, I came in a little bit late for another meeting, but uh, whatever little that I saw, I immediately created to uh, 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 basically uh, a round table uh, that I conducted for the for the inter colleges, uh, uh, for between the colleges in Hyderabad, which essentially imparted who has skills for the emerging world and the gig economy. And I could see that ethics and morality as well as value system, which is an essential part of being able to be successful in, in, in uh, creating themes of the future, was, I think, the main purpose as well as uh, uh, part of the skills that you were highlighting in your presentation, and I liked it. I think um, uh, being able to bring it uh, to all the students and the engineering communities across the world in the manner that they can think uh, and they can relate to, is, this is a great way of being able to do it, and I'm very happy, Krishna, that you have taken this initiative, and the webinar is very useful. Thank you. We should actually do it at a personal level and uh, take it across even at the professional level uh, in the future. 
I think uh, I would love and the presentation. I would love to be interacting with you in the sure. long term. Okay, I'm I'm going to move to the Rajan from Arizona State University, and maybe so much Akrabati after that. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. We can hear Rajan. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, excellent presentation. Yanis, I agree with everything that you have said. Obviously, we don't have a lot of time to discuss. But one thing that Krishna and I and a number of other people have been discussing is is a good number of these problems are because of rural migration into urban areas. And we have to find a way uh, that problem is slowly being addressed in the US. Homelessness is a big problem in Los Angeles area. So society as a whole has to address the problem to make it more attractive for people to live in rural areas and lead a rich life rather than move to urban Absolutely. areas. Yeah. Absolutely. This is happening uh, already in some different ways. Um, I think that uh, a, an agile and fresh thinking uh, about many of these things is important. And, uh, you know, I believe that we are, as a society, underperforming in this category uh, because simply I think we don't put enough attention to this uh you know talented people like engineering uh, mindsets can be used in a very significant and interesting way and i think that's something that that um, can be done yeah great i'm going to ask maybe soma or sushma to jump in soma are you sure. There? sure this is soma and I, i'll be honest i wasn't prepared and i'm sitting on my desk and answering you first of all thank you so much for uh, to uh dr uh your thoroughs, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, yes. for your yes. presentation, it really touched my heart um, and resonated with it. Um, I think this is very applicable to all areas and all, in all regions in the world. And uh, specifically, I have been mostly in the US uh, for most of my life and, uh, and taught there and worked there. So I will say that it is, uh, 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 these days when the, in, we bring up the engineers uh, in the classroom, um, this has to, uh, the, the humanity part and the way they are wor working for um, the sustainability issues or the betterment of world, these have to be intertwined with the engineering curriculum. We cannot of eliminate course. our... Um, another Absolutely. Case, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Students have changed a lot these days. They also search for meaning. They also search for a purpose. So we yes. should be teaching them also that how we see the world and what they will be seeing later on and help them achieve that. Thank you, Soma. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm yeah in fact, you are... Yeah, go ahead, Yanis. Yeah, yeah, I think you're, you're touching also another important part, which is, uh, I mean, certainly in the United States, the, um, I won't say uh, in, among our engineering students, but that definitely uh, the sense of purpose and identity is becoming important. And some students go through, you know, I think the, the, the rapid changes that are happening uh, create some sort of a, um, a mental uh, health situations as well. So it's not uncommon to see that. And I think this is where uh, projecting, uh, you know, the human values in this, and also the the, the fact that you can use all this for for very good purposes, it is an important uh, way to to address these these questions as well. Great. Uh, I'm I'm going to, I'm going to try to read out some questions from the audience that has sent in text okay. questions. In the meantime, uh, Aditya, would you like to say something? You had a comment, question, Aditya, or Sushma, or or uh, John Tarakan? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, I posted a question. Actually, I'm in a train, so uh, audio is just coming and fading out. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Raj from Illinois, you want to? Okay, John, Tarakan, Sushma, anybody jump in? I've unmuted some many of you. I'm not sure if it's working. But, uh... um, this is this is John Tarakan. Thank you, Krishna, and uh, thank you, Yanis. That was a fantastic presentation. It really echoed and. Uh, just as one of the previous speakers, I guess, Shoma said, it touched my heart uh, because this is, I, I just had, by the way, the opportunity to finish reading a whole new engineer by Goldberg and Somerville. I guess these are the people mm -hmm. part of the Allen College. Uh, and yep. they had an opportunity to hear uh, Dave Goldberg uh, when we were in, in India at the uh, WEF conference, at the ICT mm -hmm. uh, conference that right. Krishna had organized. 
and everything you say echoes with me uh, and uh, these are things I think we need to inculcate into our engineering faculty uh, in terms right. of how they start visualizing uh, their role in the world and their role in their students' lives in terms of uh, the, 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 the different things, not just competencies, but actually mindsets and ways of thinking that we have to inculcate in our students. So I really appreciate your presentation and I look forward to being able to uh, review it more closely when you, when you share it. Uh, and thank you, Krishna. Absolutely. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Sampada, Sampada, oh, go ahead, uh, Yanis, re reaction. And yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, the role of the faculty is extremely important, obviously. And uh, I think um, we see uh, certainly a lot of acceptance, particularly from the uh, more junior faculty that join, us, join the school. Uh, they are much more open to this. I think that. Um, uh, you know, there is definitely a need to reinvent <laughs> the way we think about these things. And uh, the truth is that if you don't reinvent yourself, you're going to become obsolete. And so it, it becomes, it will become a necessity not too long into the future. So. Okay. Uh, Raju, Sampada, do you want to jump in or should I move on? Yeah. I... All right, Sampada. Yeah, this is Sampada here from uh, India. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Yanis. This was a wonderful presentation yeah. and opened my eyes. And as others have also said, it echoes a lot of feelings that we all have. Um, you know, the question I have is uh, uh, the, the way humanity is percepted or the way we define ethics kind of changes from region to region based on how uh, you know, the local conditions are. So thinking about India and Indian colleges, and particularly the ones which are mostly influenced by technology uh, in a very random manner, how do we uh, bring in this uh, with the college faculty and the students so that it is correctly understood and correctly applied uh, without having any consequences which cannot be handled later on? Yeah, so, you know, I, I come to India often, like at least once a year, um, and uh, I'm trying to understand a little bit the structure there. I think, uh, just like in many other countries, um, you know, most of the educational and the curriculum uh, uh, structures di are dictated uh, from the top, and so, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, and so I think there has to be a change both from the top and, and, and the bottom, I think, for, for this to, to, to be, uh, to happen. And I don't know, you know, how um, the, the political decisions are made at the top to make these changes. Certainly, if there is enough, I suppose, uh, buy-in at the lower level, not the lower level, but at the, at the, at the grassroots level in, in a university, that, that change perhaps can happen. Although, I do agree that um, I think that the the challenge is how to to enable this by also including uh, a more uh, um, sort of an enlightened view of engineering and technology. Maybe the National Academy, Indian National Academy of Engineering, can help there uh, in 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 a way that it is much more more appropriate. And so I I I I I think I see the issues that are involved. Um, on the other hand, you have some new new schools that are developed um, that I have interest in different ways by which they go to solve this problem. So, yeah, it's not it's not as easy. <laughs> Thanks, Ambada. Uh, yeah, and this uh, is Raju. Yeah, go ahead, jump in. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think you know it is an excellent inspiration for everybody. Uh, one thing you know, you mentioned about ethics and legal. You know, all the things you mentioned is great for the engineering community. But I think we have to bring people who are involved in the legal community or, you know, the ethics or decision making. So to make it more successful, so that it is beneficial to the whole humanity. Completely agree with you. Politics, uh, political people as well, uh, very, very important. Uh, yeah, there was yeah. one comment about that. How about policy makers? <laughs> one of the text yep, questions. Absolutely. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, and Sushma, and Sushma, can I? Go ahead, Sushma, come in. Yeah, come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was great listening to you, sir. And the thing about growth mindset and fixed mindset is something we will have to deal with, uh, with yeah. respect to teachers and students, if we have to yeah. implement it. Uh, but in fact, when I was listening to your uh, talk, uh, I kept on feeling that some of the things which we are doing in our institute, uh, you, uh, the way you were mentioning. 
like ethics or uh, uh, the values and working with the local government local people and especially my institute being located in a rural area so we have a community around which has lot of problems and then what we do is uh, we have a political leader, leader with us and then there is a local governance in every village and then we get connected with that local sarpanch we call the village head and then we talk to them about their water issues and we solve their issues along with our students and faculty so whatever you were mentioning uh, that thought process really helped me thank you so much well, wonderful wonderful i'm very glad to hear uh, and that's where <laughs> the societal impact is yeah we have a volunteer here shalini volunteers to uh, help uh, <laughs> politicians about sustainable development goals you want to jump in there shalini from california uh, can you hear me yeah go ahead shalini uh, yeah No, not coming. Okay, oh. but we figure that out. Let's see. Um, a couple of people have said, "Hey, we need more of you, Yanis. Uh, you know, this is not enough. We need to have you come back again." <laughs> okay. Uh, more <laughs> webinar, one of these days, we'll uh, sure. do that. Okay. And um, uh, let me, uh, Shalini, are you ready to say something? I think more audio is not working. Oh, just a minute. Let me. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, is is it better? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I teach. I'm not an engineering professor. I teach at a college where we only focus on SDG for policy professionals. So I'm in I'm in California too. So we can connect and you know move this forward. Okay, great. I think somehow the connection is breaking up, Shalini. But I think she says I I teach. Uh, sustainable development goals to policy for to policymakers. So I'm happy to help. That's uh, so she's a, a, a she's a faculty member in California. Fantastic. I'm going to quickly go through. We yeah. have about five minutes. I'm going to go through the uh, some of the other things um, uh, that that are happening that that are here. Uh, and uh, thanks for sharing the presentation. I can correlate that with what's happening in, the, in India. Uh, bringing concept to ecosystem society. Uh, we are from BMS College, interested in the talk, gather, attend. Many of them are in groups, actually. Students are sitting there in front of a camera. And, and so uh, and so that's really, uh, they're saying the reaction is very good. Students are enjoying it. I, I think, and then again, I think we need more extended webinar. Uh, Mangal is saying, my students are excited and gave many compliments. I rightly focus on development of the mindset, value, and ethics. Uh, how we can set students' mind uh, for, for humanity. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. Can then then the uh, fifth bucket is uh, let's see. Can you suggest a method how that fifth bucket can be filled by technology? I'm not, I think that in the bottom of your bucket there was one that that was there. Yeah. I don't. Which one was that? Do you uh, know. National, yeah, this was the National Academy grant challenges, but did not have a a, a bucket on society. And uh, I believe that this is something that has to be put in there, uh, perhaps in partnership with the National Academy of Sciences or medicine uh that, that's that's something that needs to be done yeah. and uh and push i'm pushing for that <laughs> yeah and again can you elaborate a little bit more on the mindset a couple of comments on that that's, can you talk a little bit about the mindset issue that you emphasize so much sure um so the idea here is that um you know the traditional instruction and the way we we uh engineering education is happening at the high at the higher higher engineering institutions um, is, you know, you have the professor uh, teaching the students uh, material and so on and so forth, um, which I think is today you can get knowledge and skills from the internet. You can get it from, from Siri or Alexa. Uh, a few years from, uh, from now, Alexa will be very, very good at, at, at skills and, and, and knowledge. And so the question is, where is the value that needs to be added in an engineering school? And I think this is in the development of the mindset. Uh, and, and, and these mindsets are the ones that I that, uh, I'd articulated five of them in there. Uh, and the, the, the way by which your process or, or, or your um, experiences are becoming uh, driving for you for, for, for how to reinvent yourself, how to be agile, how to be uh, accepting ideas, and how to be able to, to con constantly change in the way uh, you, you address your you, you um, approach these various, various issues. Um, I think that you will see a lot more uh, um, situations where engineering schools or other schools as well will have group uh, uh, things outside the curriculum 
Uh, there will be a lot of supervised uh, uh, activities of this type and, and sort of guidance more than you know the traditional way by which we we, we instruct right now. I think it's a, there is a revolution that is coming up in this direction, and I think we have to to to, to uh, embrace it and change with it. Last question, and then we'll wind up here. Last question has to do with the um, research mindset and entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, do they go hand in hand, or are they contradictory in sometimes? Well, research is discovery in some way. Entrepreneurial is taking this and making having an impact. So I think the two are not necessarily the same, uh, and they are, but they are complementary. Um, uh, you know, so one is thought leadership, uh, trying to create something new. Um, on the other hand, that entrepreneurship innovation it means that it has a tangible impact to society. It has to be that way. Great. Uh, with that, I think we should uh, you know, let uh, Yanis go. <laughs> it's early morning for him. I think it's good to work up from 8 o'clock. I have to go to work, right? <laughs> take care of a college, right? So, uh, exactly. Exciting. Uh, yes. uh, Yanis, thank you all, and thank you for the audience. Uh, you know, we thank almost you. had 100 people. We still have more than 200 people with us. Thank you, audience. Thank for you very much. Uh, your session and being with us, interacting, and uh, maybe we'll try to get Jan, convince Yanis to come with us uh, maybe in a few months again. Uh, to elaborate some more. So thank you. Yeah, all. Have thank a good you. night. Bye -bye. Good evening. Good morning. Whatever wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Bye bye. Bye. bye.